California. Amen. I've been in contact with him once or twice. But every once in a while I'll go check. You, do you know why? Of all of the churches, and there were Bible-believing churches, but the young people were still caught in a snare. They were still snared. They were not taught these things directly or literally, lovingly. I, I, and, and listen, look at, verse number, look at verse number 28. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Say that. If you marry, you've not sinned. You say, Brother Bob, you're skipping some things need to be added to this verse. Oh, yeah, just wait. But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. And nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Watch this. But I spare you. See the word spare? There's a word spare in verse 28. And there's a word snare in verse 35. Spare in verse 28 snare in verse 35. When I preach this to the young people, they always know the title. I touch this in the Philippines. When I open this chapter, do you know what they'll say? You know, I'll start hearing it in the congregation, the young people that have been there year after year. They'll, they'll, you'll start to hear them say, I spare you and not snare you. <laughs> that's what I title it every time I get in the pulpit. That's what I say. I'm here to spare you not snare you. Amen. And they've learned that over the years and it gets passed on. Now, I won't be going this year, uh, I've, I've determined. Unless God does some major, major changes somehow, I will not be going this year because of my parents and June's dad and we don't know about Annabeth. So I don't want to be out of the country uh, during the spring of this year. Many things could happen by the beginning of summer. All right. So, but I, I hope that, that you'll take this and I hope that you, maybe you can help somebody with this. Now, in the verse, verse number one, it said, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. See that? Does the Lord want young people, all people, not just young, not, we're not talking about just teenagers, but does the Lord want us to avoid fornication? Yes, it does. Fornication does something to the mind, does terrible things to the mind. Does terrible, does, I'm talking about to the very, I believe it even does something to the physical mind. After a time after time, sin that is added to sin, that is, especially the moral sins, especially the sexual sins, that it affects, that it darkens the mind. Pornography darkens the mind. My, my mother has, so I don't know what it is, I'm not a doctor, but my mother, they told me that my mother has what is called, on the, it's a mass on the front of her brain, it's not cancer. It's like a tumor, it's a mass of some kind, but it's called a meningioma. I guess it's related somewhere to the condition meningitis, but she doesn't have meningitis. But the, the mass that she has that's causing her right now to be so unstable is a darkening of her mind. It affects her memory and it affects her stability. And I believe sin does that to the mind. That's what's called in the chapter number one a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. I believe a reprobate mind can no longer make proper decisions about life and eternity. I believe a, re a reprobate mind is one that can no longer think correctly about God and His Word. And that's possible for any individual to come to that condition and to that state if they indulge their mind, indulge their mind, indulge their mind with wickedness. And sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. You, all of us have met some people that we doubt really can ever be recovered. Haven't we? we we've met people, we think this, this personal, we think. Now, let me say this, the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse sin and the blood of Jesus Christ can change anybody. Yes, it can, but they have to willingly repent toward God. Yes, they've got to will, willingly repent toward God and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the blood of, the blood of Christ can have its effect. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. So what's the assumption that's made? And let every woman have her own husband. 
Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. What's the assumption that's made that affects and, and it broadsides the culture of the West today? It actually inv- it inv- it invades or broadsides the culture of the world today. It, it, this passage makes the assumption that, that God intended what he said to be true in the second chapter of the book of Genesis. God created man, male and female, created he them. And that is the assumption that Paul makes in the seventh chapter. And without having to be hateful, we don't have to be hateful to preach this. We don't have to be unkind to preach this. All we have to do is be honest. We have to be honest to preach this passage. Let, that, uh, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Uh, let, me, let me illustrate this very quickly and very simply by saying, in the Philippines, many men go abroad to earn money for their families because they think they can't get a job in the Philippines, and many of them stay away for a year or two from their family and send the money back. Do you know they're in violation of this scripture? And temptation, temptation constantly bombards these people because they are not with their spouse. And if they're saved, you know the devil wants to ruin their testimony. Every time someone has come to me for advice, for counsel in the Philippines, should I go to Saudi Arabia and work in the oil fields? I can send home a lot of money to my family, and I really think my family needs that money and so forth. I, my counsel is always, no. No. Because you'll be away from your spouse. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. You understand, I don't say this arrogantly, but you understand why this message would not go in nine-tenths of the churches that you know anything about (laughs) around here. And I don't mean that to be unkind to them. I just, we just know that this is not obviously not preached in our day. We live in a generation, this is not handled literally and and, and definitely on the text of the Scripture. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. My wife has as much power over my body as my, as my wife as I do over hers. In this regard, you understand the regard we're speaking of here. The necessity to be together. And God created that way. And God created the marriage bed to be undefiled. It is undefiled. But adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. The marriage bed is undefiled. And God made that as a gift. God made that as a gift in marriage. Defraud ye not one another, verse 5, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, and Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. See, so the devil is tempting people that spend an inordinate amount of time away from their marriage, away from their home, away from their spouse. I know evangelists, thank God for them, for the stand they take. They'll go and preach in other churches, but if they can't take their wife, their stipulation is they must be home, they must be able to drive home every night. They can't be so far away that they can't drive home to their own wife every night. Amen. That's to protect their testimony. Amen. Yes, it is. Amen. Yes, sir. When I do go to the Philippines, I'm there for three weeks. And, and they know I preach on this sea. So brother, the pastor, Brother Ben, he's 77 years old. He always, he always, try, he always play, tests me with this verse. He said, but you didn't bring your wife with you. I said, then don't feed me. That's, what, that's the way I answer him. Because it says, except you give yourselves to pray, fasting and prayer. See that? So when he comes to me, he's joking, of course. He's joking. And we're not talking about three weeks. We're talking about men that go away for a year. Six months, three months. That's trouble, folks. That's trouble. Now, in in that meeting, I'm only in that meeting. I'm in the atmosphere of prayer. I'm in the atmosphere of preaching. 
I'm my, my, my life is an open book while I'm there to the people that are there. I don't go anywhere else, but it'd be with them. You understand? So when Brother Ben gigs me with this, I say, and don't feed me then. The only thing, what's left, what's left out is the fasting part. I said, so don't feed me. <laughs> Amen. Don't feed me while I'm here. I'll, I'll be fasting for three weeks, Brother Ben. Because Satan tempts, doesn't he? Now, there's a time for a wife to get away and spend time with the Lord. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean four months, five months, six months. Doesn't even mean three weeks. But there's a time for a wife to get, there's a time for a wife to be in another room away from her husband and with an open Bible and have her own prayer life before the Lord. There's a time for a husband to go into another place, into his own closet, open up a Bible and have prayer, have his own prayer life and walk with the Lord. And love for him will, help, love will him, for him will develop love for one another. And, and by the way, that's in church too. When we have trouble with each other in church, our affections are not on the Lord, is, are they? Verse number 6, but I speak this. Now let me, let me show you this because we're at verse 6. Can I take some time this morning? Are you all in a hurry? Can I take a little time? Look, verse number 6, but I speak this by permission and not by commandment. And when you go down to verse 10, it says, and unto the married I, com- I command, yet not I but the Lord. See that in verse 12, it says, the rest speak I, not the Lord. And verse 25 says, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. See that? And so people will.